So it's my great pleasure to uh, introduce today's speaker, who is Jim Estes. Uh, Jim studied zoology at University of Minnesota and Washington State University, uh, then went on to do a PhD at University of Arizona uh, in biology. Uh, from there, he went into federal service working with the Fish and Wildlife Service and transitioned into his position at uh, UC Santa Cruz at the Long Marine Lab and uh, USGS, uh, where he has been for approaching four decades now, something like that. <laughs> um, so I think many of us are familiar with Jim's work. Um, he's done extremely influential work on the role of sea otters in the nearshore marine ecosystems, establishing sea otters as a sort of an archetypal example of a keystone species, uh, and exploring many interactions sort of up and down the food chain from sea otters. Uh, I think today we're going to be hearing a bit of a long view, uh, a really nice overview of the role of sea otters and kelp forests in forming the ecological history of the North Pacific Ocean. So Jim, welcome. <coughs> Thanks very much. Um, yeah, well, so what I, I was here about 10 years ago, 15, 20, I don't remember when it was, but a while back, the last time I was here for a seminar, uh, and that was when I was kind of right in the middle of everything, and, and now things have changed, and I'm looking back, and, and I'm in the process of, of putting together a, <coughs> a, a book on the work that I've done on sea otters and kelp forests, and so I thought what I would do is kind of give you the abbreviation, abbreviated version of what the major modules of that, of that is, is. So that's what my, my talk today is going to focus on. Um, <clears throat> the work that we have done, let me just start out by trying to establish a little bit of a conceptual underpinning for what we have done, my colleagues and I have done. Uh, it's really been motivated by, <clears throat> by six, six issues, conceptual issues. One of them has to do with the recognition of the distinction between species themselves and the way species interact with one another. Pretty fundamental. But it's kind of embodied in this, this printout here. If you imagine species being the nodes and species interactions being the linkage between nodes, it's the, the perspective of the interplay between those two things. So species interactions have been a fundamental part of the way I've looked at the world. A second conceptual underpinning is the directionality of forcing. That is, the relative importance, the degree to which, the relative importance, or however you want to say it, that these species interactions are pushing upward from the bottom of the food web as opposed to <coughs> downward from the top of the food web. <coughs> the third conceptual issue has to do with indirect effects. Indirect effects simply being effects that go from one species to another by way of one or more intermediaries, all right? As opposed to direct effects, which don't have any intermediaries. The fourth conceptual underpinning is connectivity, linkage among species and across ecosystems. When I first started working in, in ecology, it never dawned to me that ecosystems are connected with one another in important ways. Now I think they all are. <clears throat> the fifth part, which came from seeing strong process in this system, uh, the fifth conceptual under underpinning is the importance of evolutionary change and the interplay between strong selective forces of species interactions and evolutionary response and how those two dimensions to nature interact with one another. And the sixth and probably the most fundamental and the most important part of it all is I don't think you can see anything in nature without perturbing a system. That's my bias. Uh, I think it's very difficult to understand process and especially to understand species interactions which are essentially invisible to us without perturbing species. And so that really is the way that I have looked at nature and the way that I've gone about trying to understand this system. So that kind of gives you a, a body of some ideas of what I'm going to be talking about in terms of specifics. So perturbations, going to that very <clears throat> to, that, to that part of it. The major perturbation that has motivated the research that my colleagues and I have done on sea otters and kelp forests has been the no North Pacific maritime fur trade. The North Pacific maritime fur trade hunted sea otters to the brink of extinction 
They recovered in some areas, but not others. And it was that disturbance that has given us a window into how this system works. <coughs> so here it is in a little bit of a different way, just a, a geographical perspective on that perturbation. So the blue line shows more or less the historical range of sea otters in the North Pacific prior to about the mid-1700s when the, when the North Pacific fur trade started. We know that they occurred from about central to southern Baja California all the way over to northwestern Japan and all places in bet between where the water was sufficiently shallow for them to be able to make a living. They were hunted to the brink of extinction and by the brink of extinction I mean there were perhaps several million sea otters in the mid 1700s spread across the North Pacific. We don't know for sure but something like that. Uh, there may have been less than a thousand in 1911 when they were finally protected. And those thousand or so animals survived at those red dots. Those are where we had little teeny surviving remnant colonies. They were reintroduced to a few other places in an effort to kind of push the recovery of the species across the entire North Pacific Ocean. And they were, re they were reintroduced uh, at the green dots. So these are the places that otters survived or were put back into the system and essentially what we have done is simply compared areas with and without otters or watch them change through time. It's as simple as that. Everything that I've done is really focused around or built around that approach. Most of the work was done in three areas. <coughs> the Aleutian Archipelago, which is where most of my work is done, and I've, I've worked in the Aleutians for two reasons. One is that the islands have been really neat units, experimental units, so to speak at the scale that I do perturbation analyses. So islands are, are more interesting places to work than just stretches of mainland coast. Uh, also, I just love going out there because it's a cool place and there are no people around and it's just a wonderful, wonderful place to sort of rejuvenate your spirit and your soul if you're one of those people like me that likes wild places. There's no place wilder than the Aleutians. I've also done a fair amount of work in Southeast Alaska and Vancouver Island, and I'll be telling you a little bit about some of that as well. All right. What we have done is we've looked at places with and without otters, imagining that this whole place at one time was a place with otters, and we've looked at places through time before and after otters were either abundant or uh, and became were, were rare and became abundant, or were abundant and became rare. So those are the kinds of approaches that we have used to understand this system, all right? <clears throat> so how do we characterize the system? Well, one of the problems is it's a big place out there, and, and how does one gather data that are going to be convincing on a large scale as to process occurring on a large scale? These animals move around on a large scale. The North Pacific Ocean is a big place. You can't sample the whole thing. You know, it's just absolutely out of the question. So you have to take measurements that, that are going to be representative and are going to provide some data that, <coughs> that hopefully can be used to make inferences over a much larger scale. So the way that we have done that is we've picked small places to go sample because we just can't do it any other way. You go diving and you go to a small place. That's all there is to it. All right. We have uh, established a sampling technique uh, of, of picking representative sites around these sample units, islands or wherever they might be, chosen those locations a priori without any knowledge of what was down on the seafloor, gone out, sampled them in a random way, dropped a quadrat on the bottom using a random technique, and we've measured the abundance of kelp and the abundance of urchins with knowledge of the status of the sea otters, whether they were there, whether they weren't there, if they were abundant or not abundant, if they're declining or increasing or whatever. So that's pretty much what we've done. And we've done this at a whole bunch of different places across the North Pacific. But this is where a lot of the data that I'm going to show you on kelp and urchins came from this approach. All right. So here it is, kind of a summary of about 30 years of going to these places where otters were either abundant or absent or changing in abundance. So the two panels in the top are data from the Aleutian Islands on the left and from our sites in southeast Alaska on the right. The dark uh, symbols are from places where otters were present and abundant. The open symbols are from places where otters were absent. Um, 
and each symbol represents a covariate of the biomass as a surrogate of the abundance of sea urchins in, in the system, which are eaten by otters, or the density of kelps, how many kelps there were in these plots. So each site is actually not a plot, each site is an island or a time, all of the data gathered from some island at some time. And so all of those dots represent an island or a time that we sampled at some point in time over, over the course of our work. The, <coughs> and what you see from this is that when otters are abundant in the system, that is the dark dots, you tend to have high but variable densities of kelp and relatively low and generally invariant abundances of sea urchins. We see that in southeast Alaska and we see it in, in the Aleutian Islands. Uh, there are some subtle differences in that distribution between southeast Alaska and, and the Aleutians, but the basic pattern of the distribution of those points in space is about the same. These data are from British Columbia. The panels on the left shows the difference between two sites. Let's see, Barkley Sound, the open dots, those samples were actually gathered 1998, 1994, and 2007. Barkley Sound is a place that never had otters during the course of the study. They were there at one time, but they weren't there during the course of the study. Or Cheklesset Bay, which is up on the north exposed outer course of, coast of Vancouver Island, where otters were present in abundance throughout the course of the study. And so you see pretty much the same pattern in along the outer coast of Vancouver Island as we've seen in southeast Alaska and in uh, the Aleutian Islands. These are some data from Cayucat Sound. And Cayucat Sound is an interesting place because it was sampled three times. Once when it didn't have otters in 1988, once as they were colonizing in 1994, those are the gray circles, and once after they had been there. And so you can actually watch it change. This isn't, a, this isn't a space for time analysis, this is a real time analysis, so we could actually watch it in one of these places. So, everywhere we've looked in the North Pacific, from the British Columbia, for the Canadian US border, north across the Pacific Rim to Russia, we've pretty much seen the same thing. There's a lot of variation in there, but when otters are abundant in the system, urchins are relatively rare, kelps are abundant. When otters are gone, urchins become super abundant, kelps become very rare. And I think we can say that with a fair degree of empirical support based on all the things that we've done over the years. Here's another thing that we've done. Because when we first started doing this work, way back in the 70s, we didn't know that urchins ate kelp. In fact, it wasn't until Bob Payne and Bob Vadas published a paper in 1969 in marine biology where they actually did an experiment removing urchins and, show, and showed that kelp recruited into those sites that anyone ever really realized the dynamic relationship between urchins and kelp. So one of the things that we have done at a lot of these sites is that we've actually gone in and measured the intensity of herbivory. And the way that we've done that is simply by taking a piece of kelp and putting it on the seafloor and looking at how much of that gets eaten over 24 hours next to a piece of kelp in a cage that the urchins can't get to. And so these are the differences between the, the experimentals, that is the, the, the kelp that's just dumped out on the seafloor and the cage controls in places where otters are abundant, and this is what it looks like when they're absent. So what we see in places where otters are absent is, is, is a process that supports the pattern that we see. Much higher rates of herbivory in those systems. Oh, what's this? Restart later, not now. <laughs> All right. Okay. So, so this is the way I see it, just in a cartoon form. We have, this is the evidence for a trophic cascade that's occurring in this system. It's very strongly driven by predation from the top of the food web by otters in this particular case. When otters are taken out of the system, urchins become abundant. They eat the kelp. When otters are put back in the system, urchins become rare, kelp becomes abundant. And, and it's, that's the way I see the system. And here's a picture. This is a photograph of Amchitka Island that was taken by Paul Dayton in 1971, I believe. Might have been 1970, uh, when otters were abundant at Amchitka. Here's basically the same place about 30 years later after otters had essentially become extinct in that system for reasons that I'll, I'll, I'll talk about later. And, and you can see how remarkably it's changed. Those, those green things that 
maybe aren't real clear in there are all urchins. There's no kelp left in the system. So we see these things happening through time as well. So now I want to talk a little bit about the dynamics of how these systems change between kelp-dominated systems and urchin-dominated systems because it's, it's really, it turns out it's very interesting and it's not as simple as you might imagine. You might imagine that as otters become more abundant from being absent in the system to becoming uh, very abundant in the system that this phase state difference between either being a kelp-dominated system or an urchin-dominated system might gradually change. Or you might imagine that it occurs in a very punctuated way, as, as is indicated by the, by the uh, middle panel. Or you might imagine that it actually is a system that occurs in a punctuated way, but is characterized by hysteresis. That means the directionality of change also is going to have a big effect on where the tipping point is in going from one state to the other. All right, so we were interested in this, and we had had some reasons to believe that it was a system that didn't behave like the one in the upper panel, but maybe more like one of the lower two panels. So this is work that was done, a lot of this work was done by uh, one of my former grad students, Brenda Konar, who's at the University of Alaska now. <coughs> this thing is not behaving. Okay. Low. Okay, so first of all, let me just show you the full body of data that we have gathered from different islands in different times on the abundance of urchins and the abundance of kelp across the Aleutian Archipelago over the last 40 years. Some of these data points are from places where otters are abundant. Some of these data points are pla from places where otters are absent. Some of them are from places where otters are at various ranges in between, all ranges in between, all right? And what you see is that regardless of that, the data tend to aggregate into two groups, you know, either a cluster that sort of defines this urchin-dominated phase state or a cluster that defines the kelp-dominated phase state. In some cases, they're fairly close, but you can actually statistically identify whether a system is in an urchin-dominated state or a kelp-dominated state with virtually 100% accuracy, with relatively little sampling effort. So we've done that, and we've gone out and measured these things. So now we can actually define whether the system is in this state or the kelp state, that is the urchin state or the kelp state, based on samples that we take, and then we can relate that to the abundance of otters in the system. And we've done that, and this is what it looks like <coughs> for a declining system, the dark open uh, bars, or sorry, dark open sim symbols, and, and the smooth line is actually a, a uh, logistic regression fit to those data. And here's otter density, and <coughs> this is based on the collapse of the Aleutian Islands that I'll talk about a little bit later, all right? So in that case, the trajectory of the system is as you see it here. These blue data are actually from Attu Island, where I spent about 25 years watching the system recover. That is, the otters recolonize the system and the population grow. And the trajectory of recovery in that system is very different than the trajectory of collapse. So this indicates that the system isn't also, not only is it characterized by these phase state differences, but that hysteresis characterized is, is a fundamental property of this transition. That is, it depends on the directionality whether the system is recovering or whether the system is collapsing as to where this phase state shift between the urchin-dominated and kelp-dominated system is going to occur. Why is that? Why would that be? Well, to understand that, we have used, uh, we've, we've tried to, to, to take an experimental approach by looking at patches of kelp. We've found that there are places in the Aleutian Islands where there are small patches of kelp and there tends to be a very sharp transition between the urchin areas and the kelp areas. So you just hear some data showing distance within the barren area, within the kelp area. Here's, here's the break right here between them. And these are just some different data showing urchin densities, brown algal data, and folios, other folios red algae. And you can see that there's a very sharp transition that occurs here. So we've become very interested in the dynamics and the behavior of that transition zone in understanding these shifts going back and forth. All right. Here's some more data to show you a little bit about the urchins. And um, what it shows is the, the um, 
the one thing I want you to look at is the gonadal index, index uh, of these urchins in the barren area, right at the edge, and in the kelp forest. So what happens with these urchins when they get into the kelp forest is that their gonads become very large. And they do that because there's just a lot more food there for them. All right? You can see the abundance of the various algae and so on in those places as well. Okay, these are some data from an experiment that Brenda did in which she removed either urchins or kelp from these patches and looked at the dynamics of the system and the behavior of the system. So here is a control, all right? So she went out and monitored this in July, August, December, November, and one year later. Uh, she measured the abundance of algae and the abundance of urchins. You can see that urchins basically remained, <coughs> uh, let's see, that the, the um, urchin densities remained virtually zero throughout, throughout and that the kelp kind of declined a little bit in the winter, but was abundant throughout. Now, the other three panels show particular treatments. The top left-hand panel is a treatment where the algae were removed and the urchins were added. And so what do you see in that? What you see is that eventually the urchins disappear and the algae come back, all right? So even though the algae were removed and urchins were put back into that system, it recovered. It didn't stay an urchin-dominated system. The treatment B, the one in the upper right, is one where the algae were simply removed and nothing was done with the urchins. And what you see is that the algae recovered and not much happened with the urchins. Treatment C is one in which nothing was done with the algae, but the urchins were added into the system. And what you see is that there is a decline in the, in the algae, and then it recovers, and that the urchins disappear. So what do these experiments tell us? They tell us that even if a system is kelp dominated, if we take the algae out of that system and put urchins into the system, that it basically is a kelp dominated system, and we can't do anything to that system to change it to an urchin dominated state. It just won't go. So why is that? Well, there's a simple explanation. And that simple explanation is that urchins eat kelp, and that keeps kelp out of urchin-dominated systems. But kelp actually beats off urchins. And so when kelps become established in an area, the physical interaction between the kelps and the water movement prevents urchins from coming, becoming established in those sites. And so that's what keeps the urchins from invading these kelp patches. It's, there's nothing about it other than just the kelp is, is basically winning the battle the plant herbivore battle there. So we've come to see this system as one in which the interactions between kelps and urchins is very context specific. In the classic sense, in a place where we're in urchin barrens, the kelp has a very strong <coughs> beneficial effect on the urchins, as indicated by the plus here, whereas the urchins have a very strong negative effect on the kelp, a classic predator-prey or consumer-prey interaction. But when you actually get into a kelp forest, this changes fundamentally. The kelp has a negative effect on the urchins under those circumstances, and the urchins essentially have no effect at all on the kelp. So it becomes, it becomes sort of an, a mensalistic react, uh, interaction. It switches from be, being a typical predator-prey interaction to an mensalistic interaction. And that explains the process of hysteresis in the system. Okay? So I spent a fair amount of time talking about the dynamics of this because, because the subtleties of the way these things work uh, are, are, have, have, have begun to impress me as being much more complicated than anything that I would have ever imagined in the beginning. All right? So now what I want to talk about is the indirect effects. All right? I've been talking mostly about direct effects of otters on urchins, urchins on kelp, indirect effects of otters on kelp. But what about the effects that this trophic cascade has on other species and other ecological processes? Yeah. We start later. <clears throat> well, here are the various players and processes that I'm going to be talking about. Over on the left are the direct interactions, the effects of otters on urchins, the effects of urchins on kelp, and the way those link together to form a trophic cascade. What we've been interested in is what does the effect of having more or less kelp in the system, depending upon whether there are more or less otters in the system, have on other processes? And we've been interested in the effect that this might have on the carbon cycle, and we've been uh, interested in the effect that kelp has either as a source of habitat or as a source of primary production on other consumers in the system. So I'm just going to show you a little bit of data from some of the things that we've done. <coughs> 
to convince you that, at, at least in parts of this system, that these, these indirect effects spinning off of this trophic cascade are very significant. So here's some data from a paper uh, we published quite a long time ago, which provides a surrogate of the difference in net primary production between sites where otters are abundant and where they're absent. What we did was we simply took baby mussels that were settled out at Friday Harbor Lab, we took them to the Aleutian Islands, we outplanted them to islands where otters are abundant, we outplanted others to islands where otters were absent, and we measured their growth rates. And what we found was they grow at about twice the rate at places where otters are abundant compared with whether they are absent. Why does that happen? Because they're just more productive. There's more kelp in the system, there's more organic carbon floating around in the water column, filter feeders grow faster. Here's some data showing the relative abundance of one of the dominant kelp forest fishes between sites where otters are abundant in black and absent in, uh, in gray. And in this case, the, this is a catch effort measure for a rock greenling. It's a hexagrammid, one of the dominant fish in that part of the world. And what you can see in this system is that fish are about eight times more abundant. These kelp forest fish are about eight times more abundant when otters are present in the system. Not surprisingly, because they live in kelp forests. Here are some data uh, making the same contrast, but looking at the diet of glaucous wing gulls. This is a dominant gull species in, in the northwestern Pacific. Uh, and if you look at sites where otters are abundant, what you see is that the majority of the diet of the gulls is fish, and a very small part of their diet is made up of invertebrates. If you go to places where otters are absent, they eat relatively few fish and lots of invertebrates. So their diets are really remarkably different depending upon whether otters are present in the system or not. The gulls. Are invertebrates urchins? Or they urchins, chitons, mussels, limpets, all, all collectively all the invertebrates they eat, but mostly intertidal invertebrates, yeah. Here's some similar data for bald eagles. These are data that were actually gathered through time, uh, a synopsis for, of surveys that we did of about 300 nests all across the Aleutian Islands back in the late 1970s and early 1980s when otters were abundant in this system and then 20 years later after they had collapsed. And when otters were abundant in the system, the eagles ate a relatively even mix of marine birds, fish, and mammals. Once otters were lost from the system, they became predominantly seabird predators. <clears throat> and this is the last little piece. This is from a paper that we published last year, that Chris Wilmers and, and several of us published in Frontiers, uh, <clears throat> in which we looked at the potential effect of this otter urchin cask uh, 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 kelp cascade on the carbon cycle. <clears throat> Essentially, all we did was a back-of-the-envelope computation of the storage effect of, of having otters in the system based on the relative um, amount of kelp that was in the system when otters were abundant versus when they were absent. And we could calculate this because we had data from all across the North Pacific. We had data on the, uh, <coughs> the chemical composition of the kelps. And we had data on the carbon uh, concentration in the atmosphere. And so we could essentially make this calculation. We could look at how much of the atmospheric carbon would be sequestered in the living kelps if otters were there compared with when they weren't there. And so what we found in doing this, uh, we, we, and we made two computations. One was what we called a storage effect. That was just simply the instantaneous amount of carbon that would be held in an organic form in kelps when otters were pre present versus when they were absent from, from the whole North Pacific ecosystem. And then flux. Flux is based on the net primary production, the amount of carbon that's actually moving through the system. In the case of kelp forests, flux is a lot higher than storage because they're very productive. So kelps turn over their biomass uh, probably about, on average, about four times per year across all kelp forests. So it's a very high flux rate. So if you look at <coughs> The difference in either storage or flux between systems where otters are present or absent, you see they're very, very different. We've actually made a computation for the storage effect. We've calculated that if, if you define the atmosphere as just that part of the atmosphere sort of under the dome, under the dome in this case being the part that, that is just defined by the, by, the, by the coastal ecosystem within which the otters live, uh, 
that the storage effect is about 6 to 11 percent of the total atmospheric carbon dioxide. Or if you want to turn that around a little bit and ask how much of the post-industrial revolution increase in atmospheric CO2 is accounted for by this effect, it would be somewhere between about 20 and 40 percent. So in this particular system, the impact of the otters on the carbon cycle is really significant. Okay, so now I'm going to move on to this question of, of sort of evolutionary effects. I've been talking about strong interactions. If these strong interactions have been playing out in this system for a long period of time, even if they haven't been playing out for a very long period of time, even a very short period of time, if there are strong interactions in there and they're somewhat repeatable or predictable, we ought to expect some sort of evolutionary response, some sort of change in selective regime. So, <coughs> so what we have looked at, my colleagues and I, and this is work I've done mostly with Peter Steinberg, who's now at the University of New South Wales, uh, starting when he was a PhD student at UC Santa Cruz, is that we have imagined that this is the way the system works. And so we would imagine a system in which otters were not present uh, to be one in which there was very strong selective pressure by herbivores on plants. And comparably, in a system where, or similarly, in a, in a system where otters are abundant, we would imagine that their effect in reducing those herbivores would break the strength of that selective interaction. So that's a tough hypothesis to test. Uh, and, and the way we decided to, to look at it, I'm not even going to call it a test, because I, I wouldn't call it a test. I'm just saying we decided to look at it, because it did carry something predic certain predictions, <coughs> was, was to compare the plant herbivore interactions, uh, the dynamics of plant herbivore interactions in the Northeast Pacific, which is a system that has evolved with otters, with kelp forest systems in the southwest Pacific, which has never had an otter, never had otters, and they don't seem to have any predators that are comparable in their influence in that system. Nothing like, that's not to say there aren't predators there, they just don't do what otters do in the North Pacific. So that's what we did. So the first thing we did was we went out and did this, this uh, experiment or these, these series of measurements of the rate or the intensity of herbivory in these systems. So this is a reminder, here are the data from a system in the North Pacific where otters are absent. Here are data from a system in the North Pacific where otters are abundant. I showed you those data before. And then here are data spread in between from uh, a number of marine reserve sites in New Zealand. <coughs> and what you see is, is sort of an inter interesting intermediate. <coughs> The rate of herbivory in these sites isn't near what it is in these otter-free sites, but it's much higher than what it is in the otter-dominated sites. And that's pretty much a consistent pattern that we saw. So that was interesting. <laughs> when Peter first got to Australia, he sent me an email and he said, this place is amazing. I haven't even looked at the algae yet, but it smells different. <laughs> he said, it just smells different. and and and. Peter had been working on florotannins, and we were interested in florotannins as a potential chemical mediating effect on plant herbivore interactions in the system. We knew that florotannins are present in all the brown algae, uh, and we knew that in some, some cases that they functioned either, either uh, by happenstance or perhaps by selective purpose uh, as, as a deterrent to herbivory. All right? So we measured the florotannin concentrations, and, and this is a, a kind of a, a, for any of you that know very much about, about natural products chemistry, you're gonna, you're gonna realize that this is a very complicated sort of a measurement because florotannins are super complicated. But there are some simple assays for collective florotannins, and so that's what we did. So we measured the florotannin concentrations, percent dry weight, on all of the dominant kelps in the North Pacific, and that's shown in the upper panel and all of the comparable brown algae, some of which are kelp, some of which are other, other groups, other, other families of brown algae in the southern hemisphere. And on average, the, the mean percent dry mass of florotannins in southwest Pacific kelp forest systems is about an order of magnitude higher than it is in the North Pacific. So the kelps in the North Pacific basically have nothing in them. And the really dominant kelps, like giant kelp and laminaria and pteragophora and the stuff that you guys that work in kelp forests know, it's got nothing in it. I mean, it's got really low florotannin concentrations. 
the really dominant kelps in the southern hemisphere got a lot of it in it and that's what Peter was smelling when he went out there it's just everywhere and it's really really remarkable uh, it's just a, an astringent odor that you detect when you walk out onto a seashore in the southern hemisphere damn Okay. So <clears throat> we became interested then in, so what's the impact of these floritannins on the behavior of the herbivores in the southern and, nor and northern hemisphere? Realizing that in the northern hemisphere that, that these herbivores don't see much in the way of floritannins, and in the southern hemisphere they see a lot of it. All right? So the question then became, how does the floritannins impact their fitness, and in particular how does it impact their grazing behavior? So to, I don't know what that's looking like to you. It looks terrible to me. Uh, well, these are petri dishes, <laughs> and those green things are uh, are, are uh, uh, freeze dried ulva, which every herbivore in the world loves to eat. So we freeze dried the ulva, and then made these little um, little cookies out of the ulva, and then added into the cookies different floritannins, so we could we could have grazing models in which we could ma manipulate the secondary compounds in the system. So we could look at the degree to which flor cookies that had either floritannins added to them or not added to them were consumed by herbivores in the southern hemisphere and how that same experiment would influence herb herbivores in the northern hemisphere. And so here are the data. <coughs> this is from a paper we published a pretty long time ago now uh, in PNAS and it essentially shows the NSs are no significant difference between experimentally doctored up cookies with floritannins and those that are controls that don't have any floritannins in them. And so what we see in the New Zealand herbivores is that the floritannins by and large don't have any significant effect on the rate of herbivory. There are a few, few exceptions, but by and large just look at the NS's across there. And it doesn't matter whether the floritannins came from the northern hemisphere or the southern hemisphere, we see about the same pattern. In California, the north, as, 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 a, as, a, as a representative of the North Pacific, we see a very different pattern. That is, we see mostly deterrence. There are a few cases where we don't, or where it's sort of marginally significant, but we see a lot more deterrent. And sort of in a meta-analysis perspective, this, this difference is highly significant between the two. And again, it doesn't matter whether the floritannins came from California or whether they came from, or sorry, from the northern hemisphere or the southern hemisphere, we see the same pattern. So, <coughs> we've gone out on a, on a big limb and, and and actually imagine that these are systems that have co-evolved in a very different way. That, that is, the plants and the herbivores have co-evolved in a very different way, depending upon the length of the food chain, and in particular how the length of the food chain is defined by whether otters is defined by whether otters are present or not in the system. So in the North Pacific, we imagine that you've got this predator that's hammering the herbivores, and by hammering the herbivores, it essentially breaks any potential for the coevolution of defense and resistance in the plant herbivore system. In the southern hemisphere, you don't have that carnivore, herbivores become abundant, and so you have a very strong evolution of defense, coevolution of defense and resistance in the system. That's how we're interpreting it. Now, well, I won't say anything more about it. I'll, we can discuss it more later. I, 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 there, there are other potential reasons that this might happen, but this is the only one that makes any ecological sense to us. So now I want to just take another step beyond this and ask the question, how does this sort of coevolutionary scenario feed back into the reciprocity between ecological process and evolution? It's a really hot topic in, 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 in ecology and evolutionary biology right now. Um, and so we've begun thinking about it in that context. So the first thing that just really blew me away was in looking at the distribution of plants and herbivores in this system in the southern hemisphere compared with what we had seen in the northern hemisphere. So these are the panels that I showed you earlier. And what we see in the northern hemisphere is, is essentially everywhere we look, we see either lots of herbivores or lots of plants, but never both. All right? When plants are abundant, herbivores are rare. When herbivores are abundant, plants are rare. And you can see it in the data. You take the same exact measurements in the southern hemisphere, we see something totally different. And that is plants and herbivores live together in high abundances in that system. So there's one 
And I think the explanation for this is very simply that the plants are much less vulnerable to herbivory than they are in the Northern Hemisphere. So they can live together. And it's probably because of this coevolution uh, of defense and resistance that has occurred in this system that has allowed that. And I think this, in turn, helps us understand why North Pacific kelp forest systems have just collapsed so spectacularly in certain instances with the loss of predators from those systems. So there's one dimension to it. Another one, and this is just pretty much arm waving, but it's interesting, is this guy, stellar sea cow. This is a, the only kelp eating marine mammal that we know of that ever occurred, at least in recent times. And, and uh, what's interesting about stellar sea cows is that they were exclusively kelp eating. They evolved from a dugonged ancestor, the, the hydrodamoline sirenians that led to this guy evolved out of the tropics from a dugong-like thing. They lost their teeth, they became kelp feeders, and the only place they ever did this was the North Pacific. <clears throat> now, that might just be happenstance, but it might also be that that was the best place to be if you were an herbivore, and a, and a mammalian herbivore at that, feeding on kelp, which might be sort of a marginal way to make a living. Another one I want, to do, I want to dwell on a little bit longer is uh, the uh, uh, potential effect on the body size of abalone. Now, how could this ever be linked into the body size of abalone? Well, I, I think it is. And, and here, just to show you how widely varying abalone body size can be, here's the biggest abalone in the world. This is the red abalone, Haliotis rufescens, which occurs along our coast. And here's one of the smaller ones, as big as they get. So there's a lot of variation in the size of abalones. This is work that I did uh, in collaboration, incidentally, with Dave Lindbergh at, at Berkeley, uh, who's had a big impact on, on my thinking about historical biology. So here's what we did. We looked at the extant fauna, and we looked at, at where big abalones live versus where small ones live. We then reconstructed a phylogeny of the abalones and, and pasted body size on top of that phylogeny to see how large body size evolved from smallness, which we we knew going in, I won't go into the explanation for why, but we knew that the primitive abalones were small. So we knew that they had to have gotten big from little ones, not little from big ones. So we, we wanted to know how that happened. And then, then we wanted to like look at the fossil record and know when did they get big? Did they get big a long time ago? Because abalones are really old. I mean, they're, you know, they're known from the late Mesozoic, so they're an old group. So did they get big a long time ago or did they get big fairly recently? So this just shows where some of the fossil and extant abalones occur. And here's some data that bear on the question of when they get big. So first of all, if you look at the worldwide extant fauna of abalones, and you look at the uh, maximum shell lengths and plot those out between tropical and temperate systems, what you see is that <coughs> the tropics have no big abalones. They're all little. Temperate systems have some little ones, but all the big ones occur in temperate systems. So all big abalones are cold water living creatures. All right. Then if you look at the worldwide fossil record and you compare and you split that fossil record and you look at everything from the Miocene and earlier and everything from the Pliocene and more recent, you find that that's where the split occurs. Do the same split between the Pliocene and the Pleistocene and we don't see anything. They'd already gotten big here. But if we look at this junction between the Miocene and Pliocene, that's when it happened. So sometime between the Miocene-Pliocene transition is when bigness occurred. It hasn't been hanging around for tens of millions of years. It's a fairly recent event. All right. So here is a, a phylogeny based on some uh, molecular uh, uh, work that, that uh, Dave and, and some of the people in his lab did. And, and essentially, it just shows a phylogeny of a number of the extant abalones the blue ones are in, are the are cold water fauna are in blue, the warm water fauna are in red, the, the black ones are some ones that we weren't really sure of, we, we couldn't really categorize them very well based on the system we used. And so what you see here is that, that <coughs> bigness evolved at least twice. It evolved in this clade and it evolved in that clade. So it's not something that just happened <coughs> once, it happened at least twice. The capitals. Oh, capitals. Sorry, I should. I'm sorry. Yeah, the capitals are big, and, and the smaller case are small. Okay. So here's one last 
figure, and this shows the distribution of maximum body sizes in all of the major extant abalone faunas around the world, Australia, New Zealand, Indo-Pacific, and so on and so forth. And what you see from this is that the faunas that have the, the very largest abalones anywhere in the world are the North Pacific, Japan, and the Northeast Pacific. So why is that? I think it's simply because that's where the best food is, and that's why they get big there. That's why abalones are bigger at high latitudes and low latitudes, because there's a lot of kelp, a lot more production in the cold uh, coastal ecosystems compared with the tropics, and so that's why they get probably why they get so much bigger at high latitudes and why they got bigger with the onset of the most recent glacial age at the, at the transition between the Miocene and Pliocene. That's why they generally got bigger, but where they got the very biggest was here, all right? So now I want to just end with a, with a discussion of intersystem, intersystem connectivity. And here's what some data that first got me thinking about it, although I wasn't thinking about connectivity when I looked at these data, and that is that we've been just surveying otters at different islands across the Aleutians for a, quite a long time, actually going back into the 1980s. Um, in the early 1990s, I started to realize that there were fewer and fewer of them on some of the islands we were working on, but I didn't believe it. I just thought, you know, I was getting old, I couldn't see or whatever, I, you know, there shouldn't have been a decline. My mindset was that this was a pristine place, there was nothing going on out there, no human impacts, I mean, otters should be happy forever and ever. They weren't. And by the time we got to about the mid-1990s, I could see that they were really taking a dump. And by the time we got out into the late 1990s, you could see that the populations had declined by about an order of magnitude. In fact, the populations across the Aleutian Islands have declined by anywhere from about 97 to 99% over this course of time. I mean, this is a huge decline over a very large area. So why did it happen? Well, <clears throat> I don't have a lot of time to explain why I think it happened, but this is why I think it happened. I think it happened because another predator came in the system, killer whales in this case. Here's the evidence, just very briefly. I mean, I could spend a whole hour talking about this in a lot more detail. Why do we think of killer whales? One, we start seeing them. Never saw them before. All of a sudden, there they were. They started eating otters. We'd never seen them eat an otter before. That started happening. We had these little refuge habitats that killer whales couldn't get into. Otters didn't decline there. And we did a whole bunch of other stuff based on how many attacks we would expect to see if the killer whales were responsible for the, the complete decline and, and essentially what we saw and what we modeled and expected to see if it were killer whales matched up almost perfectly. So in a very small nutshell, that's sort of the evidence that <coughs> why I think it was killer whales. This was a fascinating thing because irrespective of whether it was killer whales or not, we saw the system change. Urchins became abundant as the otters dropped out of the system. Grazing intensity went up as the otters dropped out of the system kelp densities went down as otters dropped out of the system. So what we see here is, is at least purportedly, the transition in a trophic cascade between a three-chain food web, or a three-link th three, three food chain and a four-link food chain, creating a switch in the intensity of plant herbivore interactions at the base of the food web, and that explains that. So why did it happen? Well, now we get to both some arm waving and to some, some areas that have become probably the most controversial of the work that I've been involved with. And so that's a whaling ship. And I think whaling had a lot to do with all of what we've seen in the system. And let me just explain briefly why. The panel on the left is, the, is, a, is a, just a, a map plot of the locations of kills based on the International Whaling Commission database. So contrary to, to what most people think, whaling is not an old endeavor in the North Pacific. There, there was whaling that went on in the high Arctic for species like bowheads and right whales way on, way, way back. But whaling really didn't start until after World War II. It started in a big way after World War II because the US, who had destroyed the economies of Russia and Japan during the war, in order to get those countries back on their feet, subsidize them to essentially turn their maritime war machines into fishing and whaling to make money to basically get their economies back on their feet as quickly as possible. And this was MacArthur's 
sort of agenda for the Pacific. That's what General MacArthur was doing out there and trying to do. So they did it. And as you can see from the red dots there, that resulted in the development of industrial whaling. Whaling spread from just off the coast of Japan right after the war into the Aleutians. It intensified in the Aleutians. And by the end of the 1960s or early 1970s, it essentially hammered the whales in the North Pacific. And the whale fishery collapsed to different species down into the subtropics. Here are data showing the number of landings in waters within 200 nautical miles of the Aleutian Islands from 1950 when it was almost zero until early 1970s when it had collapsed almost zero. Here are data showing the sea otters that I, the decline for sea otters that I showed you before. Here are some data showing the comparable trends in, uh, is it my phone, is it? <laughs> comparable trends in stellar sea lions. These things have also collapsed. They collapsed about 10 years in advance of the sea otter population. Here are data for harbor seals. They also collapsed in the system. And what I've, my colleagues and I found very intriguing was it looked like these collapse are, all came right on the heels of this whaling event. Now, why might that have happened? Well, we argued that whales were really a very important food resource for killer whales in the North Pacific. When they were taken out of the system, these animals had to either diversify their diet or go somewhere else or die, and some of them diversified their diet, and these smaller marine mammals simply were not sustainable to these large, metabolically active and abundant predators, and so they just started knocking them down one after the next after the next. Mm -hmm. All right? <clears throat> so that's the hypothesis about what's going on. I'm pretty sure this part is right. I'm pretty sure about what happened to the whales, whether the mechanisms that I've suggested are correct or not. You know, I, 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 we just have no way of really testing that. Um, but <clears throat> never stopped me from speculating. And so uh, I think it's an intriguing hypothesis. And, and so just to go back, this is the way I see this system. All right? I sort of see it as in the same metaphor as Darwin's tangled bank, that this is the, the sea otter, sea urchin, kelp, trophic cascade kind of sits in the middle of this system that there are processes that impact on the system that go on in the open ocean system. There are processes that either impact on or result from the system that go on in the coastal system. Uh, what I've tried to do in this illustration is indicate using solid lines the things that we know with reasonable certainty. The gray lines are things that are more speculative. The arrows that are going, uh, are, I'm sorry, not the gray lines, the dotted lines are the more speculative ones. The gray lines are things that sort of build around bottom up forcing processes and the dark lines are things that build around top-down forcing processes. And so uh, this system is, is very deeply interconnected in a dynamic way, both in space and across species. And so as I say, I think it's, it's, it's in my mind, just sort of a glimpse of the complexity of the dynamic process within this system. You know, it doesn't revolve around this interaction, but this interaction is, is very central to a lot of the things that are going on in the system. So just in retrospect now, I just want to reiterate a couple of, of points from this 40-year adventure that I've had in working in the Aleutians and on sea otters and kelp forest systems. First of all, perturbations have been the window for us to see things happen. Experimental perturbations and natural perturbations. You know, had there not been these perturbations, we would have never seen any of it. So I really think that in order to understand species interactions or to see them, you have to either impose perturbations on the system or look for perturbations depending upon whatever is appropriate. And everything we've done from the work comparing the Southern Hemisphere with the Northern Hemisphere, every other part of it has really been built around that. Second, <coughs> the effects of these otters are, are really numerous. Uh, they they uh, they probably permeate the entire food web. I think we've just seen the tip of the iceberg. We, we, there's so many other things that we just haven't had time to look for. I, I don't think we've exhausted the interesting process uh, or the interesting details of pattern that have gone on in that system that are related to the extinction and recovery of sea otters. We have seen some evolution that this system is a very tightly coupled one of reciprocity between ecological process and evolutionary process. At least I think there's, there's some reasonable evidence to think that that's, that's important. 
we see a system that is deeply linked on large scales of space and time. You cannot look at one little place and understand it based on that place or on that time. All right, there is deep linkage through time. If the whaling hypothesis is right, you've got to look back 60 or 70 years to understand what's going on now. Uh, if the orca sea otter hypothesis is correct, you can't understand what's going on in the coastal system without knowing what's going on in the oceanic system because that's what's driving the orcas. And, and last, I didn't talk at all about this, but I don't see any reason to believe there's anything unusual about this system. All right, we've just had an opportunity to be able to look into it. I'll, I'll say it in a little more pointed way. I, mean, I think if we could look at the world in the same way that we have looked at the otters, and people are starting to do that, you're going to see comparable things going on all across the world. There's nothing unusual about this system. <clears throat> so I just want to end with, when my computer restarts, just a, a, an acknowledgement of some of the key people and the various funding agencies and, and people that have supported us in our work over the last almost half century. Thanks very much. So I, I didn't really prompt him to ask this question, <laughs> but, but the reason is that, that in fact, killer whales uh, occur in two very distinct ecotypes that are genetically distinct. The fish eaters are different from the mammal eaters, and, and on average, about 90% of the animals that are out there are fish eaters, but they don't commingle with the, the mammal eaters, and all of the killer whale experts, and I don't include myself in that group, I, I believe what they're saying. I just all of the people that have studied these things have found that their diets are just completely separate. And so it appears as though these animals that are marine mammal feeders basically did not have as, a, as an option, a behavioral option, to start fe eat feeding on fish. Now, it, you know, that doesn't make a lot of sense, but that seems to be the way it is based on the data. You know, they just don't do it. Um, it's a, but I mean, it's probably a learning behavior. Oh, yeah. Thing. Well... Yeah, and, and the, these systems are one that are the ones that are built around intense matrilineal learning, and they go on for decades. And so what happens is that a female killer whale will have a particular behavioral repertoire, something that she will do. And she may focus a lot on small cetaceans, or she may focus on fish, or something of that sort, and she will train her young to do the same thing, and that that process just goes on in time, generation after generation, in these matrilines. So, I mean, I'll defer it to the killer whale biologist, but I mean, you're hunting whales and then you <coughs> jump to sea lions and then to right. seals and then to sea otters. I mean, all those are quite dramatic. They are in very different species, but, but, in different but what they don't seem to have done was start feeding on fish. Those guys, they just <coughs> don't seem to do it. So it seemed, and, and you know, my guess is, this is a guess, it's strictly a guess, but I don't think it was the whole marine mammal eating killer whale population that did it. I think it was just a few animals that actually did this because when we went back, when we've gone back and modeled the system, what we've been able to, to show is that these collapses of the smaller marine mammals could have happened from just a couple of killer whales. You know, they're so big, they have such a high metabolic rate, they eat so much, the reproductive capacity of these small marine mammals is so low that in the case of the otters, it would take, I think we calculated 3.3 killer whales to eat every otter in the whole Lucian Islands. <laughs> you know. And in the case of, of stellar sea lions, it was about maybe 20. All right. So I think that's probably what happened, but I, I absolutely have no evidence otherwise. No, no, no good evidence. <laughs> yeah. I was wondering, so have you seen any increase in floratans in places that have you know, not had otters? Because there have been some places, presumably, for <coughs> a really long time. Sure. Uh, we haven't looked. Um, you know, wh what we have dis uh, discovered is that these, these floritannin concentrations tend to be very conserved at about the, the level of kelp genera. And so any particular, macrocystis, laminaria, agarum, any species of agarum will have a lot of floritannins in it. Any species of laminaria will not have very many of them in it. And so just knowing that, we didn't really think it was worth wasting a lot of time looking. Now, 
it might have been an interesting thing to do. We just didn't do it. All right. For that reason. Yes. I, I don't know much kelp biology, but if, if at generic level are the southern ocean kelp and the northern ocean kelp, you know, not overlapping. So they they, they and, you know, yeah. Is there potentially gene flow? Yeah, uh, they do. They do overlap. Uh, there are some some genera and even some species that co-occur. Not a lot. Uh, and ten, what you tend to see is not much difference between uh, the, the interhemispheric members of those common genera. So it's among different genera that are more deeply rooted in either the North Pacific or the, North, North, or the South Pacific that tend to be the ones that show the differences. So then there are kelp that are A few. Broad. Yeah, the, like Macrocystis. Now, macros the giant kelp Macrocystis, which is along your coast here, sure. uh, there's Macrocystis in the Southern Ocean. In fact, it's spread all around the Southern Ocean. I think it just got there yesterday. I think it's a very recent uh, sort of, of colonist in the Southern Ocean. I think it somehow sneaked itself way across the tropics. Once it got into the west wind drift, it just went all the way around. But the genetics work that people are starting to do on kelp indicate that these Southern Hemisphere kelps are very, very recent uh, uh, colonists of the Southern Hemisphere. So and you don't know if they have the, the, uh, the chemicals? No, they don't have much. I mean, from they what we've looked, they no, they don't. No, they don't have much. Not those kelps. No, they aren't real abundant either. Right. Uh, they're not right. dominant components of the flora. Mm -hmm. So uh, there is a southern hemisphere kelp, uh, Lasonia. Okay, well, people that work on kelps here, anybody kelp expert is going to know what Lasonia is. Well, Lasonia is really abundant in the southern hemisphere, and it does have a lot of flora tannins in it. There's another one, Eclonia. Uh, Lasonia occurs in, a lot in South America. Eclonia is a dominant kelp in South Africa, New Zealand, and and, and Australia. The dominant either canopy former or subcanopy forming kelp, and it's just chock-a-block full of, of flora tannins. So, and uh, there is a little aclonia in the northern hemisphere, and it's also flora tannin rich in the northern hemisphere. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Oh, that was nice. yeah. Yeah. There was so much Sorry. variation in the kelp abundance, even when, I mean, when you had very low earth densities, mm -hmm. you had low kelp abundance. Yeah. What other factors were controlling I don't know. I mean, it just, it's just, you know, it's, it's, the system is not definable by point estimates. It's definable by sort of regions in phase space. Mm -hmm. And what we don't see is a lot of variation in urchin abundance when otters are abundant in the system. And what we don't see is a lot of variation in kelp abundance when urchins are abundant in the system. But in the, comp but in the complements, we do see a lot. And I, I don't know uh, why all that is. I, I, it might have to do with just the scale at which we're sampling. Uh, it may have to do with local process, although I don't believe it has to do with local process because we have a lot of data where we've measured these things in fixed plots year after year after year. And what we see in those fixed plots is that they're moving all over the place. So a lot of that is just, and it's not sampling variation, it's just demographic variation that goes on. So you get a lot of scope for demographic variation on that axis. Uh, and, and it has to some degree to do with the fact that, that urchins recruit very episodically, so you can get a lot of variation in abundance from year to year because of recruitment variation. And kelps are relatively short-lived, so you can get death and recruitment driving demographic variation. So that, that's about as much as I can you know, tell you about that. Yeah. Okay, well, let's thank Jim again for his talk. <laughs>